Good evening. We will now call the special school board meeting to order of March 11, 2015. Please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Announcements, please be advised that there was an executive session held immediately prior to this meeting this evening to discuss two matters of personnel. By way of attendance, Mr. Roth is absent. Mrs. Shackleford is uh, present by uh, conference call. She's actually on vacation in Florida and is dialed in to be with us tonight. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, a little bit of liberty with the agenda tonight and move some f a few things around um, to deal with what I think most folks are here uh, for tonight. So before we get into item seven, items for board discussion, I have a couple comments to make. So tonight, in discussing the school con consolidation update, this will be an opportunity for the board and for the public to hear further from the administration on, on updated recommendations and plans and for the board to discuss and give further direction. Of course, no decision will be made tonight on closing any school. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone that has participated in this process so far. I'd like to especially thank those that, have spoke, that spoke at the hearings two weeks ago. I know it's not always easy to stand up and talk about things that are so personal, but it is helpful to the board and the administration to get that perspective, and it certainly was appreciated. Since the hearing, the board has been reviewing all the materials that have been submitted. As everyone knows, we heard about seven hours of testimony on the 23rd and 25th of February, and received numerous emails since then. Many issues have been brought up, and the board has heard all of them and heard your concerns. The board members have had time to review the various materials that have been submitted and have individually shared their thoughts and concerns with Dr. Zerbe and the administration. The board has asked that he incorporate those concerns into an updated recommendation, taking into consideration the various board member input and community input. Therefore, to get right to the point tonight, uh, at this time I'd like to ask Dr. Zerbe to present his updated recommendations, after which time we'll have board discussion around next steps. Dr. Zerbe. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the members of the board take, please take seats in the front row? Thank you. and welcome to the special meeting of the Mathacton Board of School Directors. As superintendent of schools of the Mathacton School District, I plan to do the following this evening. I will address the district's actions to date on the matter of the school closings. Secondly, I will review concerns resulting from the hearing. And three, I will provide my updated recommendation to the board. But please let me make it clear. My recommendation at the end of this presentation is that there should be no vote on school closing prior to December of 2015. Yeah. 
I can tell you that this is one of the most complex, highly sensitive, and impactful issues to come before us as a school district and as a community in some time. As such, we strongly uh, need to consider how any action might impact Methacton. Our students, our families, our staff, our community, our operations, our finances, and our future. When we combine the last seven years of decreasing enrollment and our projected continuation of enrollment decline, together with the underutilization of our buildings and their future required capital maintenance, a careful look at this issue by a board of 10 is highly appropriate. The board authorized the commissioning of a study on enrollment and capacity. The findings from those studies have been presented to the board and the public. My administration worked with the consultant to develop and present a high level analysis of these findings given our core values and assumptions along with our belief in a Methacton education. The Board of School Directors scheduled public hearing and received public comment. I received similar comment from my teaching and administrative staff. We continued to collect comments while answering frequently asked questions and sharing that information on the district website. There were several reoccurring themes of community concern raised at the hearing. They include a concern for the validation of our enrollment projections and our capital expenditures. They included a concern over increases in class size, the uncertainty of care students with special education needs would receive relative to the potential changes, the concern regarding the absence of detail surrounding student and staff transitioning resulting from a decision, the rate of speed that this process is perceived to be going, and the educational impact of a decision. Our initial steps were to, to complete a high level review and, and review possible alternatives and to make sure we did what was required if it were found feasible to close any schools by September of 2015. The initial review pointed to the closing of Audubon Elementary School for reasons listed in the February 23rd presentation. The school closing hearing was advertised in order to give the school, was advertised in accordance with the law in order to give this, the school board maximum flexibility with respects to the building and to allow for action if it so determined was necessary prior to the start of the 15-16 school year. My recommendation and feedback from the hearing reflect that the fact that the closing of the two schools is not a viable option. Furthermore, the focus should continue on the possible closing of Audubon Elementary School and the gathering of information regarding the community concerns that were raised at the hearing. It is important that the complexities of closing any schools fundamentally have information that is accurate, that is reliable, and comprehensive in nature that leads to a well-organized plan of action. There must be a plan to address student and staff transition. Scenarios must be developed for the, for the redrawing of attendance areas in combination with school level enrollment projections. It will require us to gather and analyze the financial aspects of the decision, including the potential capital improvements. And lastly, it requires that we coordinate a communications, the communications of these information gathering actions. So to accomplish this, I recommend that the board establish committees to gather information regarding the possible closure of Audubon Elementary School. <clears throat> An enrollment capacity and data alternatives committee should be established to address concerns surrounding projections, capacity, education, programming, and other alternatives 
so that we can make the best decisions possible. This committee will be chaired by Mary Katona and Troy Sosnovic, members of my administrative cabinet, and will include community members and, and other staff members from the district. I also recommend that a committee focused on student and staff transitioning be established. This committee will work on addressing the needs of our students and our staff as part of a potential school closure. This committee will be chaired by Mr. Harney and Dr. Angstead, two members of my cabinet, and will, and will include community members and other staff members as necessary. I recommend that there be a committee established to work with a, a consultant or other staff members to address the redrawing of attendance areas that will also include community and staff members. I recommend that there will be a finance committee that will specifically be established to address the impact of a closure on, on the district and what those potential uh, cost and or savings would entail and what the potential outcomes of the, the building may, and how those outcomes may impact uh, the district. That will also include community members. And lastly, although not a committee, I think it's important that we have a mechanism to communicate with, with members, and so of these committees, and Angela Lynch, will communicate with the members of the established committees and collect and organize information to keep the community aware of progress being made. That ends my first recommendation, the establishment of committees. My second recommendation this evening is to direct these committees to report back to the superintendent by November 15th of 2015. These committees will provide a written report of their findings and perspectives on the matter associated with their specific area. The third recommendation and final recommendation this evening is to present these findings and recommendations of the committee to the school board for possible decision in December of 2015. A decision in December 2015 to close a school would allow the preparations to occur between January 2016 and the start of the 16-17 school year, giving us enough time to take the plans and put them into action. A decision in December of 2015 not to close a school would bring this process to a conclusion. Mr. President, uh, this ends my presentation for this evening and includes the three recommendations uh, that I have for the board's consideration this evening. Dr. Zerby. Uh, what I'd like to do now is, is uh, have some board discussion um, along the information we've received, Dr. Zerby's updated recommendations. In a matter of uh, in the interest of being fair to Maria, I'd like to ask Ms. Shackleford if she has anything to say to start, and then uh, we'll, we'll check in from her to, from time to time. Maria, anything you want to comment on at this point? Hang on, I had to take it off on mute. Um, no, the only thing that I would like to make sure, I guess, that the committee is taken into consideration, because we seem to be focusing just on the elementary schools, I think this might be an opportunity for us to look at uh, all the schools as a whole. That's it. Okay, you mean from a, a district realignment standpoint? Okay. All right, well, Maria, we'll check back in with you in a minute. Technical difficulties. Um, 
So yeah, maybe text her. Uh, so a couple of comments that I had, Dr. Zerby, that um, for for consideration. One around communication. I got several email from the public um, that some of the messages that were sent out weren't received by everyone. So if we can make sure that we figure out how to make sure that every communication goes out to everybody that's interested in receiving that. Um, and then also part of what I think Ms. Lynch should do um, around communications is build a communications plan or a timeline that the public can be aware of so folks aren't on pins and needles waiting for certain milestones. They know when certain communications are going to come to the extent that we can plan ahead on that. Okay. Um, the other note that I took was around the committees, the uh, district realignment or the redrawing of district lines. You had mentioned a consultant. Um, I think that it would be prudent if we had, if we could form the committee with staff and community members um, and then maybe had that group lead an RFP to go out and find the appropriate consultant to come in and, and work on that. Um, and then I think um, the other note that I took was, you know, we just need to make sure that the, the committees, the community involved in the committees is a broad based um, community. So. LP and Worcester, parents, seniors, business leaders, so we make sure that we have a, uh, a mix of folks from throughout the community since these, these really will affect um, everyone when, you, when, when it comes down to it. Those were a couple of the comments that I had and I will then open it up to the rest of the board. Mr. Pelicano. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just as it relates to the commentary around the validation of the enrollment projections, um, uh, I mean, I'd like to make a suggestion that we consider a second opinion. Um, as a very clear... um, I think it would be I think it would be prudent to get a second opinion there. I know that other districts have done that. And I think even our, our district as part of the Skyview uh, scenario did that. So I think we may be similar to the RFP process you just mentioned that we may also want to consider that for uh, the um, enrollment projections as well. So maybe what we do is we have that committee um, lead an RFP process as well. That brings up another thought. Um, do we want to ask Pell to, so Pell has agreed as no charge to do a second look in September. Um, okay, okay, thank you. Um, do we want to have Pell take another look at this or do we want to just take their report and have and have a second opinion um, done. That's open up for, for debate. Well, I, ladies and gentlemen, please. Uh, I think um, if I could just add, though, I mean, the, the information that may, we may need for a decision might go to a different level. Correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Zerby, but at the school level? Yeah, as part of my recommendation this evening, I, I said that the, the redrawing of uh, district uh, uh, attendance areas will require that we have uh, uh, and enrollment projections by the school level, which is not part of the current Pell report. So would they not do that for us? Uh, Pell could do that report, but typically in the redrawing of district boundaries, um, the, the, a consultant, if, if, if we so uh, have one, would do the boundaries as well as do the projections um, in order to have the data properly uh, input it into their into their system to provide a, a recommendation on the boundaries. So they would actually dovetail two possible reports that we could find a, another set of eyes or another another set of projections, as well as the use of those projections if the board and the committees felt uh, appropriate to redraw the lines. Well, if we so I don't want to go down a rabbit hole on this, but um, and I definitely agree with getting a second second opinion. Money well spent. But if we've gotten this report from Pell and multiple sources, board, community, you know, et cetera, have questions about it, let's at least bring them in in front of this committee to review their methodology and understand if if it was flawed. Then let's understand why. And if 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 we're just misinterpreting, if they did something right that we didn't, you know, that we don't, we're not following. Let's let's understand that as well. So let's not. I mean, let's bring them in at least to appear in front of the committee and you know let them explain the methodology and review the report with them, separate from getting a second opinion. I, I think that's appropriate. Okay. Mr. Pelicano, anything else? Uh, that's it right now. Okay. Other comments, Ms. Brown. 
Uh, one of the things I'd like to see with the Pell, if we're bringing them in for a second, is I want to see if they do the numbers again by taking Shannondale out of those numbers. I want to see how it reflects without that in there. I think that could be significant. Um, but. Well, let's, yeah, I mean, let's, let's charge that committee to go back and develop a list of questions on that analysis. They can go and get answers from Pell on that. And they can run an RFP to get an additional vendor to do a second opinion, and we can look at both. Christian. Uh, Mr. Well, Phillips. <clears throat> With, uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to put the board in a position that we're picking winners and losers, and we're going to slant numbers by including the community or not including it. I think it has to be thorough, it has to be accurate. Um, I think the next group that comes in takes a look at it. They look at the district as a whole and gives us a gives us a proper evaluation of our district. Um, so it, just to be keeping it very clean, very pure, the process. I, I think we're going down a slippery slope of thinking that we would keep a certain part of the community out of the numbers when we're looking at this. So. Uh, if we're putting an RFP back out, uh, it should be looking at the whole district as a whole and giving us an accurate description of what we're looking at. And yeah, I don't follow keeping part out. Would it, I'm not sure what well, you Well, uh, Kathleen mentioned the, uh, leaving out Shandell as far as the numbers, uh, as far as residents. And, I, and I, I think that's, I understood that, what she was trying to say as far as keeping them out of the numbers. I think you're referring to the fact that in the past, going back pre-Skyview, that Shannondale uh, development may have, in, may have inadvertently been included or been included and skewed the numbers. So we, basically all we're saying is we want to make sure that, that anything that's, that's factored into whatever analysis is done by whatever consultant is accurate to the extent that it can be and doesn't, it's not including, it's not including Shannondale residents when it shouldn't and it's not discounting development when it should. When it shouldn't, correct? That's, a, that's what everyone's saying, right? Right. The real reason was it skews our numbers. It made our numbers look like we had a huge increase, but maybe we didn't. So if we did that, taking those numbers out, where is our bell curve going to be? Are we at the same that we would have been without the community or not? That's what I want to see. Well, look, we can we, we have we can develop we can develop an RFP. We can have the committee look at you know all the folks that come in, and we can make an, an informed judgment based on you know standards that we want and, and who's going to do the best job for us. So, so my understanding is that the numbers that Chandel played in the, the event of Skyview was they used those numbers to inflate it so they had uh, a report so they can actually build Skyview. As your, okay, I understand that. Okay. Uh, who else? Any other comments? Mr. Phillips, go ahead. Uh, as far as uh, committees, I think there should be a, a community impact committee. Uh, we have a community, roughly 30,000 voters in it. Uh, the community, and, that, and speaking about community, that's the Methacken community, which involves both Worcester and Lower Providence. Uh, it's made up of small business, large business, seniors, people with students, people without students, uh, and the parents and students. Uh, I think it's, uh, we have to include everybody in this decision, and we should see where they stand as far as uh, tax in, uh, impact, as far as is there going to anything that, that's going to affect their business by whether we close uh, auto bond, does that affect uh, local businesses? I think we have to get input from all aspects of the community, not just who's before us. So let me make sure I understand. Are you saying to make sure all those types of folks are included on the committees, or are you saying you'd like to see a separate committee that was a community impact committee that looked at, um, in addition to those specific things that Dr. Zerbe outlined, that looked at the impact on closing a school to the entire community? Exactly. To the uh, second. Yes. It, it, and, that, and that way, it, we had, for instance, the Boy Scouts. 
and how they were going to be impacted by the school closing and uh, they might got, get a lot of membership from that school being a geographic location. Uh, so there's those little impacts that add up to a lot of uh, a big impact in our community. So I, I, I don't want to pass over that type of situation. Okay. Uh, Jim, I don't disagree. I was just thinking it could somehow be woven into one of the other committees. Um, I'm just looking at the uh, committees that we thought about, whether it be the transition type of committee, and it was talked about student and staff. Could it be somehow the community? I'm, I'm just, you know, what, what's the manageable number of committees that we want to have, and could it somehow be incorporated in there? If, if, I, if I may just say that. Um, I'm hoping that at, at some point through this process, and we may find that we need additional committees, but I, I, do, uh, I do agree with your recommendation. Allow me to, um, as part of uh, my recommendation this evening, to consider the community impact, as Mr. Phillips has mentioned, and uh, we can make it as an assignment uh, for, for one of the existing committees at this point to consider. Um, in the future, I'm hoping that the board uh, gives me uh, the approval to establish additional committees if necessary and when necessary to address issues. But um, with, with what was recommended here this evening, um, I would say that uh, the community impact should be, as Mr. Pelicano suggested, woven into one of the other committees. So where would you put that then? Um, either with the student staff transition or in the data, uh, in, in the uh, enrollment data um, alternatives committee. Okay. Other discussion? Other thoughts? Mr. McFarland and then Ms. Woodburn. Just uh, somewhat repetitive, but I support uh, Greg's suggestion that we get another opinion, but at the same time I think the committee on enrollment needs to examine more thoroughly the Pell study to see what flaws may exist so that we have a wider um, database, if you will, of what, what is accurate. The key here is, I believe, that these committees need to report out facts that are widely accepted and verified as being correct so that when the vote comes it would be based on information that can be trusted by all parties involved. And the second part of that same committee, just to reemphasize, I know Dr. Zerbe put capacities in it, but we probably need to make sure we're looking at each school and the capacity of each school um, rather than just a straight 500 uh, number. So again, these capacities would be on the basis of having examined the schools, the number of classrooms, and, and the, the requirements of each to in, or, in order to make sure that any vote that's taken would be accurate with respect to the capacities that are affected. Go ahead and then Kim. Uh, the other thing that concerns me when I went through this is um, I was around when all of this stuff started with Skyview. And part of the reason that we did start Skyview and part of the reason that we needed this building was that we had all of these modular units that were outdated and we were going to have to start to replace them. So it became part of the evaluation of whether we build or we don't. I was listening from the other side. What concerns me greatly is the fact that we still have modulars. So, um, based on the numbers that we were given, my issue here is making the right decision whether we do close or we don't, but I can't in good conscience make a decision to close the school if I have modular units attached to it. So what I'd like to ask is when we do this Pell relook and when we come out with an RFP that we look to true capacity of the building, not the attachments. Uh, Ms. Woodring, sorry. Thank you. I just would like to uh, thank the public for all their correspondence, their attachments. We've received a lot of information over the last few weeks. I attended a couple meetings and what I tried to convey at those meetings and what I would say again is we need help all the time. So your participation enabled us to take a look at some new models, some uh, potentially user-friendly reports of the same type uh, research. 
So again, um, we appreciate, at least I appreciate, all the comments, the correspondence, and, and everything that was forwarded to us. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think uh, look, this is never a fun process, anytime you even look at anything. So it's been a little painful and will continue to be painful, but at the end of the day, I think the district will be better, um, better because of it. So I agree, I echo those, uh, those thanks. Ms. Hackett. Uh, just that these committees will be focusing on the proposal, which is to close Audubon. But it seems to me this is the opportunity for us to broaden the scope of the investigation within the committees and see uh, what alternatives there might be down the line for transportation, for um, district lines between the uh, different schools, and any other things that may come forth from the committees at that time. Other discussion? Okay. Um, if there's no other discussion, Dr. Zerby, anything else? You? Oh, yeah, sorry, you're right. Uh, Maria, anything else? Can you hear me? Well, I just wanted to say that I, I guess I'm going to get on with what Kim said, that I really thank the community for all the emails that they have sent us. And I just want them to know that we've listened to them and we're taking action. I think the crowd heard you better than I did. Um, but I heard emails, thanks, and what Kim said. So I think we all get the general gist. Uh, any other comments? Dr. Zerber, anything else before I move on? Um, I, I have nothing else for the board this evening uh, on this matter. Okay. Um, you know, I, I do again want to say thank you to the public for their involvement through this, uh, through this process. Um, it was a long couple nights at the end of February, um, and it's been a long two weeks since, and a lot of uh, reading. And I, I can say that uh, I, from my own experience, all the board members have read every email that's come in. We haven't responded to all of them. Um, just because we didn't, we didn't just didn't have time. I think uh, many board members tried to respond to as many as we can, but there certainly were some um, that came in and, and were pretty powerful and 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 really touched you and um, kind of made you feel good about this community. We got a lot of lot of personal stories about um, school administrations and parents and teachers going above and beyond, um, whether it's helping a son. Uh, come out of his shell or helping a family through uh, through a life-threatening situation. So, yeah, it really kind of reaffirmed my belief in humanity throughout this process. So, I um, want to thank everyone for, for sharing uh, for sharing those stories, those personal stories. It really uh, it really was impactful, and, and it, we appreciate it. Um, so, with that, what I'll do is I'll ask if there's a motion. And then if, if we have it, since this is on the agenda for, a mo for a board action, I'll ask for a motion. If there's a motion, I'll take a motion in a second. We'll hold discussion and go to public comment on board action items. We'll take comment on both a motion that, that gets made and then the um, board action item around the field project change order. Once we get through that, then we'll come back to discussion on this motion and then we'll move on from there. So sorry to be so convoluted, but I did think that the public wanted to hear this stuff first. Um, before we got into anything. So, uh, is there a motion on Dr. Zerby's recommendation? Mr. Pelicano. Yes, Mr. President, I move that the board direct the superintendent of schools to establish committees to gather additional information regarding the possible closure of Audubon Elementary School. The committee shall focus on the following issues, enrollment, capacity, data, alternatives as one committee, a second committee, student staff transition, Third, redrawing of attendance areas. Fourth, finance. Fifth, communication. The superintendent may establish additional committees to focus on other areas as he deems appropriate. These committees shall report their findings to the superintendent no later than November 15, 2015. The superintendent shall make his recommendation to the board with an expectation that the board will make a decision in December 2015 as to whether to close Audubon Elementary School prior to the start of the 2016-2017 school year. The superintendent is authorized to carry out any and all activities necessary for this purpose. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pelicano. There's a motion. Is there a second? Ms. Hackett? All right, so I'll hold on discussion. I'll open the floor to public comment on board action items. So basically, this is an opportunity to speak to make a public comment only on this motion and the field project change order that's on the agenda. Um, if, you have, uh, if you have public comment that you want to make, I'd ask that you come forward to the podium. We can line up behind it. I ask that per, per board policy, you keep all comments to three minutes, and, uh, and, and we'll take public comment on board action item right now. I'd say whoever gets there first gets it. <laughs> well, I was first the first night, so I felt compelled to be first again and tonight. <laughs> so. And sir, please um, name and general area where you live for the record. Sure. Chris Boardman. I live on Mary Book Road in Worcester. Um, that, that's great news. We appreciate all the, the thought and the board put into that and made those recommendations. Um, myself and I imagine other people out here are uh, eager to un learn how we can get on those committees. So do you have a process <laughs> lined out now or is there going to be a communication in the future? Uh, future about how to get on. So there's going to be communication in the future. We have to we have to clearly define um, how many members we need and and what the process will be. But essentially, we'll put a kind of a call for volunteers out. We'll have a, a mechanism to respond. Most likely, an email back to um, Mrs. Coons, who's our board secretary, by a certain date. Okay. And then we'll determine the way that we you know, select the members for each of those committees. Okay. I'm sure a lot of people are eager to get on those committees. So thank you for putting them together. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Sander, Lower Providence. Um, you know, I want to, you know, first thank you guys because it takes courage to make the change that you guys did. I think that's important that you took that that step. Um, in preparing for the meeting, I actually came up with a litany of things in case you didn't say what you did. Um, but luckily, luckily we don't need to go there. Um, well, thank you for not saying the litany. Next. <laughs> <laughs> no, but on a serious note, I actually was going to bring a garbage can and put the PEL studies here and actually throw them in the garbage can ceremoniously, but my wife stopped me. Very dramatic. Yeah, <laughs> would have been funny. Um, at any rate, um, you know, I, I kind of second what you guys said, and actually, it's very interesting, Dr. Zerby, what you put up there as your as your points of the major concerns, and and one and two are the validation of the data that you were looking at, but then three and four were, you know, the impacts on class size and special education services. And I think it's really important that, that you guys really continue to look at that and that you listen to the boards on that. I know there was a lot of confusion as to what you all thought the appropriate class size should be. Even in looking at the, le the 11 points you put on the frequently asked questions, there was a lot of conflicting data. Um, you know, last year I came to you guys with respect to kindergarten class sizes and we talked about class size. So I just really want to make sure that the committees you put together understand that and that you guys take that to heart this time. Um, let me see. Not much other nice stuff. Um, no, I'm kidding. No, but thank you again. I appreciate it. And I would like to um, extend myself. I know I've reached out to Dr. Zerby a couple times and sent some emails, but I would like to be part of the process. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ashley Wilkerson, and I live in Audubon. Uh, I also want to echo the thanks for hearing us and slowing this down. Um, and I, I almost hesitate to ask this because I don't want to come across as argumentative, but the thing that's still going through my head, you're smiling, I see it, um, is I still don't know what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And I don't know if it's that we have a budget problem because we haven't seen specific numbers there. I think there are plenty of us in this room who would argue that there is not actually a capacity issue. Um, we don't know the costs for the repairs to Audubon. The only true documentation that we've been able to find is Dr. Zerby from your presentation last year, which said it was going to cost $285,000 over the next five years, uh, which, I mean, it's a lot of money, but compared to the field project, it's chump change. So I guess my question is, if we're forming a committee, maybe we should first identify what the problem is, and then instead of forming committees to figure out how we're going to close Audubon if we decide to do it, figure out how to fix the problem that we've identified. Maybe closing a school is how we fix it, but there are a lot of really smart people out here, 
maybe we don't need to close a school and maybe we can find something to fix whatever this problem is that will benefit all of us in ways that we haven't imagined yet just by involving the community a little bit more. So my request would be don't form committees to close the school, form committees to solve problems. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Stevenson, I'm also a parent of Audubon students. Um, I kind of echo the same comments that Ashley had. You know, I feel like through this whole process, I feel like Audubon Elementary has been targeted unfairly because we're, like I said previously, a great school, great students. We have a huge amount of students and it's, it's just such a vibrant place. So I just ask you to consider, you know, Please just don't target Audubon specifically. Just look at, like Ashley said, what problem are we trying to solve? The other thing I want to say is that, you know, it, the whole process has been so emotional for me personally. Um, I say this with peace and love because I'm actually a really nice person, but I've sent some really strong worded emails because I felt like I had to. And I, I don't understand why. What, what you presented tonight could have been presented last week, but you were so certain two weeks ago to say, you know, definitely let's close Audubon um, in the 2015-2016 school year. I just, I still don't understand how you could do that, um, and and that still upsets me. So, but one good thing about it is that it's brought the community out and together, and we're watching. Thing, some of the things you said tonight about a communi communication plan, I mean, that's just a given. So, you know, that, some of those things should have been said, I think, a couple weeks ago. Um, lastly, I'm really glad to hear you using the word RFP because I made a right to request on when we get a vendor to come into the school district, you know, do we get several estimates, do we interview several, several vendors because we need to make sure the process is objective. So please, on the um, point that Mr. Pelicano made and others on the board, make sure it's an independent second opinion if we do go out and spend, you know, additional funds because we need to verify, you know, there's a saying, trust but verify. We need to make sure that the, the vendors we select are objective. Um, so again, I just wanted to echo some of those comments on the whole process. My issue was always with the way the process was being done, uh, not necessarily with the fact that we may or may or may not need to close an elementary school, but um, you, you, you kind of um, made the community uh, just basically, you know, for me personally, just so stressed out, my kids coming home every day, are you going to close the school? I love my school. I mean, those types of things, you know, don't shoot from the hip. Um, so I just ask you to consider, you know, what's gone on, and I think you have, and I do appreciate it, but all of what just happened previously probably should have been, you know, totally reversed. You know, we should have had this presentation two weeks ago. So thank you again, and I just wanted to make those comments. You know, one thing I, I do want to make sure is clear, I, I don't want, and I can understand how people may get that opinion, I don't want folks to think that we're targeting Audubon, because we're not targeting. We're not saying we're going to close it. We're not saying, we're, we're saying we're looking at that. And I understand where, I understand where, where, where you're coming from, but, but no, no decision's been made, and no one on the board has made any decision whether or not to close any school. Um, and and we, should definitely, we should definitely share more information around um, some of what brought us here. It's been presented at board meetings and, in the past. And, and, I, and I appreciate that, but why, why not take Audubon out of the particular recommendation? If you, you, know, you must know something so specific about Audubon. What's wrong with Audubon? Where's, why is the target on our back? Because I, I just don't, that part I don't get. Yeah. So, you know, come to our school. Come to our home and school meetings. I haven't seen a board member at our home and school meetings, and I've been there for every one. But I know that board members have gone to other home and school meetings of other schools. I want to see that. And, you know, we're, you know, we're here working for the school, working for the kids, and we want to help you too. It's not like we're, we, I don't want to be in an adversarial role, but I can't, um, you know, 
I have to fight back when I think it's it's sure. just you know and it's we're my being fault targeted. To okay. Take you over your three minutes, but uh, yeah, I apologize. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, Andrea Reese, Lower Providence. I do. I've thanked you twice before. Um, and I do want to thank you again for your time as volunteers during this period of time, but also all year. Um, I did want to clarify one thing, and Ms. St uh, Mrs. Stevenson brought it up, and, and you also brought it up this evening, about this being an emotional and personal issue. I guess we have to say, yes, it is a little, it is emotional, it is personal. I'm sure many of us lost sleep over it. But it really isn't. There might be an emotional and personal piece, but this is about making wise, accurate decisions in a timely and appropriate manner that is best for education. So I do, it is somewhat hard to keep hearing it's emotional or personal. So I did want to clarify that. My one issue with the motion is timing. I think we all applauded. We were glad to hear you take a step back and look at things that might have should have possibly been looked at prior to. But so the committees, if I understand correctly, are going to meet back, are going to meet, come back to you in November, and then about a month later in December, you're going to make another vote. Um, so in those 30 days, or give or take, there might be more information that's brought out like it was this time. I also believe this is an election year. So I was wondering if that vote is before the new board is sworn in or after the new board is sworn in. I'm just curious about the November, December timeline of the motion. That's something I wanted to bring up. Hi, I'm Gary Landsberg, Lower Providence. Uh, first off, thank you. Uh, I have to admit, I was beginning to get worried that you guys weren't hearing us. Um, so I know it took a lot to, to turn things around and come back and listen to the community, and I appreciate that. Um, used a lot of the right words tonight. Uh, second opinions, alternative studies, getting the facts, listening to the community, getting the community engaged. Um, regarding the committees, committees that uh, Dr. Zerby wants to form, um, with the exception of the redistricting, the community formed those committees weeks ago. Uh, there's been folks working on that. So they're a month ahead of you, and there's some really smart people who have been working on it. I would encourage you to reach out to them and use them. They will reach out to the rest of those people that were in those, in the, in those committees to help you. Uh, as far as Pell goes, I would be happy to spend 10 minutes with all of you, and I can explain exactly what they did. It's not that hard. Um, if you want to talk to, to Mr. Waters again, I can help you with that, probably save you a ton of time, and you know, prevent the wasting of a lot of hot air. So thank you. Hi, good evening. Uh, Ed Olson from Collegeville. I do want to thank the board for, well, I guess it's really Dr. Zerby, actually, for changes in his recommendation, because the board hasn't actually voted yet. And certainly not to question Dr. Zerby's credentials, but I certainly find it very concerning that it took the people here to come up with the ideas that you just now re-recommended. And you didn't think of this two weeks ago, or when this was presented to the board, and all of you just voted, yeah, we're going to take this and we're going to make the recommendation to close Autobahn. I mean, there, there was no, that's just very, very concerning. Um, also, it's my understanding that the board was not allowed to discuss the closing or this whole plan, uh, you know, from the initial hearing that was held in February and then the vote that is still scheduled, obviously, for, um, When's it scheduled for? I forget. May, thank you. So it would be my understanding that you have to now pass the new recommendations because you've already violated that 90-day term from February to the May vote. That's all. Yeah. Just, just to clarify, I think the uh, Dr. Zerby and 
the motion makes it very clear that there is not going to be any vote uh, in May if this um, motion is passed. And the, uh, the decision of this board will be made according to the motion, not prior to uh, December of 2015. That is my understanding of the, of the motion, and I'm looking at it uh, that was read by uh, Mr. Pelicano. So uh, the board has, has not violated anything with respect to any uh, uh, three-month uh, limitation. And, and related Related to the gentleman's comment about uh, not making these recommendations other than other than this evening, um, on my uh, rec on my um, uh, presentation on the 23rd, I clearly stated that it was imperative that we form committees, and I'm just thankful that this evening um, the board is is considering them with your help uh, to uh, move the committee structure forward so that we can work together to address this issue. Joe Orson, Collegeville. I, like Andrew, had a much more negative intention for my three minutes, but I'm going to try to, I'm still going to speak my heart, but I'm going to try to be more positive about it. Um, first of all, I want you to know that I want to believe in you. I want to believe that you're truly making the best decisions for the education of our children, but to date, um, with a possible glimmer of hope from this evening, you've made it extremely difficult. And it seemed like the more I paid attention to what you were doing, the more faith I was losing. The perception is that you conduct your business behind closed doors. You seem to make decisions out of public eye, and then you go through the motions of a meeting in front of the public with little to no conversation on the topic. There is no real open and honest debate within the public to view. view. Um, the recommendation, to be clear, is the same as it was previously. The only thing here that's changed is the timeline. So I, I do believe that you've heard us, but I don't think it's had the impact that um, you would like us to believe. Most of us probably believe the decision to close Audubon was already made before the possibility even became known to the public. Most of us probably believe that you've already spoken with Audubon land development about the sale of the property. Most of us probably believe that your motivations are political ideology and purely financial and that you're not disclosing all pertinent financial matters. I echo, what problem are we trying to solve? The road we're now going down is to explore the implications of closing Audubon and putting a plan in place to do so. What I'm asking from each and every one of you in this undertaking is to make it your mission to regain public trust. Treat this as it should be, a mission to find truth and do what is best for the education of our children. Be completely open and honest about the impact on our kids, teachers, classroom sizes, special education services, redistricting, transportation, costs of closing the school, and savings gained from closing the school. Back up and reevaluate the capacity study using the standards we really want in our schools. Not too many kids in classes and not the use of rooms and facilities that are not appropriate. The schools are working well the way they're utilized. Let's not dismantle them just to fit more kids. Realize and contemplate the shortcomings in the enrollment and the capacity studies rather than plug your ears and let the consultant defend them. Ask for best and worst case scenarios. Get a second opinion. I'm sure the board that approved Skyview was also certain that their numbers were correct. So I'm glad to hear that you really are going to go out and get hopefully an impartial second opinion. If you do these things with a team of parents who are truly empowered to make meaningful and significant contributions, speak their minds to the board and honestly share information with the public. If you can show that Audubon can be closed without lowering the standards for our children, cutting services or handicapping our teachers. If you can show how cost savings or income from the sale of the property can be used to improve our schools, then you have a chance to win parent approval and support.
If you find out that Audubon cannot be closed without negatively impacting our children, that this is not a sound decision educationally, then I implore you to do the right thing and keep Audubon open. If our schools need help financially, we can work together to solve that problem. If you are able to find $5 million for something so comparably insignificant as a football field, I believe you have the ability to find the money our schools need to maintain the standards for education in our district. And really, shouldn't the goal be to constantly improve the quality of education in our district, not just maintain it? Right now, up, last, last little bit, right now, you're villains. What our kids need are heroes. Step up and do the job to the best of your ability and with nothing but the welfare of our children and their education guiding your decisions. Don't succumb to pressure of, from others. Up, Don't make this about politics. Stand and serve with integrity. Okay. Be heroes, Thank you. please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Reich. I'm from Audubon. Um, I'll echo the sentiments of others that uh, I applaud the board for moving in, in the right general direction in terms of slowing down the process tonight. Dr. Zerby's presentation identified or tried to categorize the feedback that had been received today. And there was one thing that was, I thought, missing uh, from that summary. Uh, it was alluded to by the last speaker. And it's the lack of transparency that has perceived to have occurred around the process to date. Um, you know, I think what you've heard is that the perception of the public and the community is that the board is operating in a trust deficit right now based on what's occurred to date. And you have to go above and beyond to try and make that up. So, and I have to say, to be frank, the way in which the agenda was posted for tonight and how little it said didn't help. So we need to do better. You guys need to do better. A few suggestions. The process for selecting and constituting the committees needs to be open and needs to be well communicated. The committee process itself, the meetings, how the committee does its work needs to be open, it needs to be communicated. Obviously, I'm sure your solicitor will tell you it is going to be subject to the Sunshine Act, so you need to treat it as such and probably go beyond that as well. The reports shouldn't be presented, the reports of those committees, that is, shouldn't be presented for the first time at the November meeting where they're presented to the board. They should be posted publicly well in advance of that meeting. They should be open for public comment. The public should be able to come to that November meeting, if that is in fact when these reports are presented, informed about what they say with the opportunity to consider them. And perhaps, as has been done with the Pell uh, and Thompson reports to date, identify issues that maybe the committees didn't consider and perhaps should, should be considered. So I, I think the, the bottom line for you all is don't just do the minimum that you're required to do to communicate to the public. Don't just do the minimum that you're required to do to involve the public in the process and to keep the public aware of the process and to give the public an opportunity to participate in the process. And this goes beyond the individuals select sit, serving on those committees. It, it, it goes to everyone who's sitting in this auditorium and who came on the 23rd and on the uh, 25th as well, and, and everyone who couldn't make it. So be transparent, do more, post transparent agendas, post reports, and, and make up the perceived deficit in public trust that has been created by the process to date. Thank you. Michael Ryan, Audubon. Uh, first, I would also like to say thank you. Um, and not just for me, I'll extend it for my daughter. Um, she can't be here because of the time of these meetings, but I will tell you that this will mean a lot to her because unfortunately, for as much as my family tried to keep the kids out of this, they heard about it. They heard that they might lose their school, they might lose their friends due to redistricting. Um, and that's concerning to me because it does show how hastily you rushed into this process. As others have said before tonight, all of this could have been done the first time around. These committees should have been done, that we should have had community impact, we should have been um, talking about RFPs and cost benefit analysis and all this. 
Um, so I would hope that not just with this decision, but all major decisions going forward, that we slow it down in general. Let's think about this and not make a large public outcry have to happen for you to truly think about what's being put in front of you. Um, for the Pell study that was put out there, the people showed, so many people showed how wrong the numbers were. Um, I would hope that we wouldn't have to show you that, that you would take the time, read through it, um, the idea of Shenandoah being brought up in there. Yes, they're talked about in the report, but they're not actually included in any of the numbers. I mean, that's stuff that you could see reading through the report. That, um, next thing would be transparency. It's been mentioned before. Um, please don't let these committees that we're forming and everything be for show. Um, so I'm seeing, I'm, I'm seeing a very quick turnaround again. Um, yes, that these committees have until November to meet, discuss, figure things out. Um, but then you're talking about meeting again in December and making a, again, a quick decision because from, its, from my understanding from the presentation, none of the board members will actually be on these committees. It will be other people running these committees, um, the community, staff members. So you're giving them basically, um, if you're trying to do it before the election, two to three weeks for them to get back to you to make another decision unless the 90-day cycle starts over again. I know May 25th was supposed to be the 90 days. If we take that off the, the table, will that then be started again in November? Will that push it to January? I'd like some clarification on the timing of the original proposal to close Audubon, which should have been voted on as early as May 25th. Will that change going forward with what's been projected tonight? Um, and finally, the last thing is, there was a lot of right to know requests. Um, and I think that should probably give you an idea of how flawed this process was. If you were more transparent, you showed people things, we wouldn't have to inundate Angela Lynch with every possible thing that we could find because we're scrambling to keep our schools open. So again, thank you for my daughter. I appreciate, I hope that this process changes going forward and thank you, have a good night. Hi, my name is Jennifer Cancro, and I'm from Worcester Elementary School. So we're here supporting you guys. Um, my only question, I think committees are fantastic because I think it gathers your information and it allows you to make critical, really like right on target decisions. I guess my only thing is I'm an occupational therapist. I work actually in two different school districts. I treat children from kindergarten all the way up until high school. When I treat a student in an IEP, I get direct care, indirect care, consultation, consultation to student, consultation to staff. There's variables when you treat a student. So upon that, though, you also treat a child, whether it's an inclusion model where you're sitting in the classroom, but you also treat a student in a class alone or you treat a student in a group. So there's many variables to just me as an occupational therapist. So if I were to be on your committee where it is a student staff committee, I think it's fantastic, but you have to have a subcommittee for special education. And when you look at that, what scenario will you give to me? When I look at it, I think, okay, am I comparing Audubon and their children and what their services are and how they're going to be taken into the different schools or am I going to look at now Worcester closing down and going to different schools? Because you're saying that we're not targeting Audubon, but a committee really needs to go down to the very minute. Therapists have time. It's a very, actually it's very specific. I base my timing on the students. I base my schedule. I base my groups. I, and so when I have, I can't have more than five kids in a group. You can't do it by law. You can't do, so you have to kind of look at the committee and really give them specific directions. Are you saying we're closing Audubon and these are where the children will go and what's going to happen and who, you know, or are we saying different scenarios for different schools? I don't know if that makes sense, but you're going to make that one committee be all over the place and they won't be successful to provide you with very clear, decisive actions. So. I also work for the committee, I also work for the company that you guys hire. They're a phenomenal therapeutic company. And I know that they would definitely be helpful with you as a consultant to try to really show you what services the children need on all different levels. So, thank you. Uh, 
Um, I'm Erica Sabinski, and I'm an Audubon parent. Um, and I'm happy to know that on Monday, when I register my daughter for kindergarten, it'll still be in Audubon. Um, <laughs> I'm hoping for some clarification, and I'm sorry if you said this and I just didn't follow. Um, in November, when the committees present, are they presenting just to you, or are they going to be presenting to you in a situation like this where we can hear it? And then once they present to you, are we, as the gentleman said before, are we going to have access to that information beforehand, or we, will we only hear it for the first time then? Will we have time to comment? I'm unclear on that process. Um, and I'm hoping that maybe you can give some clarification for those of us who don't work in settings where we're used to presentations from committee, because the gentleman before seemed to know what was going on, but um, I don't know what's going on, and maybe I'm the only one who, but I'm hoping usually when I don't know something, there's at least one other person who doesn't know. So could you give us some elaboration on the timeline of what's happening for that present presentation by the committees in November through that December? meeting and, and I don't know, that's my question. <laughs> so we'll, we'll share the process. Um, what I would anticipate it would be um, reports are submitted to Dr. Zerbe from the, from the committees on November uh, 15th. They'll go up on the website after he's had a chance to review them so the public can review and then the board will schedule a meeting um, at some point after that and you know we may ask those committee members to present we may just take the written report um, but we'll make sure that the community has a chance to review them and also knows what the plan is uh, prior to getting close to that okay so review them and um, comment on them before that December uh, recommendation or just review them and sit on our hands and twiddle our thumbs? Well, when you say comment, you mean comment to the board or comment to the committee? Um, either. So I mean, I, I mean I like, like in February, we were all able to have previously reviewed yeah. documents yeah. and come here and ask questions and present what people felt were flaws laws and all of that. So, we'll, so if we'll, we've only got a month between so we'll November and the we'll, December recommendation, then... So we'll define the process going forward okay. by law you know, we have to take public comment on anything that we do. Okay. So there absolutely by law will be an opportunity to speak at that meeting. Okay. I would anticipate there will be opportunities to speak directly to the committees as they do their work. And like I said, we'll make sure that those reports are, are posted on the website or distributed in some way prior to the meeting. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. David Kohler, Lower Providence. Um, first of all, I think like everybody else, I applaud the recommendation to decompress the process for the decision making. But again, like most of, like a number of other people, Dr. Zerbe's laid out some pretty hefty goals or requirements for the information that these committees are going to produce. They're going to produce a final product on November 15th. At that point, I would think Dr. Zerbe and his administration would need to review that and then incorporate that into their recommendation for the board. And if the board is going to hold a vote on December 15th, you have now compressed the timeline again. So the only thing I would say is that November 15th for the reports and perhaps December for public comment and a vote at a board meeting in January-ish after comment. That would give the administration time to carefully review and it would give the public time to review and everybody has a chance to comment before a vote is taken. Thank you. My name is John Ferrara. I live in Eagleville. My daughter goes to Eagleville Elementary. Um, I'm frankly disarmed by the uh, by the announcements and not entirely sure what to say. I wasn't prepared for the announcements that you were going to make this evening. Um, Dr. Zerbe, I, I, um, moving the vote to December is really good. Um, that is after the elections. That's fabulous. That's I think a very great confidence building measure. Um, Mr. Pelicano cited the um, the accuracy concerns that um, that a number of us, a number of us have been bringing up. Wonderful, um, Ms. Barone, you brought up the um, the concern about the modulars. Fabulous. Um, it's great to hear listening on these issues. I'm very um, pleased with that. Um, so. I've been bringing up uh, concerns about the study. There are two big things that stood out to me with regard to Pell. Um, looking at it, 
just for a short period of time. Um, one, enrollments have in fact been growing. That's counter to what Pell had predicted. Um, and that's happening in the period when we might expect that their predictions would be most reliable. Um, furthermore, it appeared that sections, they were counted incorrectly. There were problems with the way that the sections um, were quantified and the, the criteria by which sections were, were lumped in with one another. And that's, that's a significant problem because that constitutes the denominator in the student-to-teacher ratio. Um, with regard to the, to the meeting on the, on the 23rd, um, it, in so many ways it was so bad. Like it was, it, it's, it's been an interesting couple of weeks. And, um, and that, that set it off. Um, I, I suspect inadvertently, I, I don't think that you expected the, um, the kind of reaction we got from that. Um, but I, I, I know from your perspective, um, like uh, it's, it seemed that there was, um, you know, suddenly people coming out of the, coming out of the woodwork. Um, I want to disabuse you of that, of, of that preconception because um, like s school board meetings, I'm, I'm assuming are normally not that consequential. When an email comes through and says, we're thinking about closing two schools, all of a sudden um, there's a huge amount of drama with, that comes with that. Um, from our side, the, the announcement at the end um, th that Dr. Zerby was making a recommendation to close a school, um, boy, that, 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 that really made it seem like we were too late, like everything was marching ahead very, very quickly. So, you know, I, I want to look at this as an opportunity. Um, there are, you know, I, I think the problem was that people were seeing, people were thinking that consequential, very consequential decisions were being made on the basis of a single study. Um, and it turned out that that study had notable problems. So let's take the opportunity to come to consensus about how these kinds of decisions should be made in the future. Maybe that would be a good use of our time here. Um, I think that um, Ashley Ray is defining problems. Uh, I think that's really important. We need to know what we're trying to solve here. Um, I, I would suggest perhaps setting criteria for the conditions under which we would consider a closure um, and gain community consensus around that. And I think it would be advisable to track empirically um, what's happening. The PEL report, it, it is theoretical. It's saying that in the next five years, in the next ten years, this is what we can expect to happen. Well, maybe. And what they're saying, you know, that's concerning. There's going to be this precipitous drop in enrollment. Um, I get that, but to make a decision to go ahead and close on that basis alone inevitably seems hasty, right? So tracking empirically over time. John, can you start to wrap up? Sure. Tracking empirically over time, I think, would be a great way to go about this in the future. And finally, you know, let's get to know one another. I think that one of the big problems has been that, um, uh, that this was the first time I'd encountered any of you. And granted, I don't come to school board meetings. Um, they, they don't sound like something that's normally going to interest me. Maybe I'll do a little bit more of that in the future. Come meet us as well. I mean, I'm a good guy. You're a good guy. Let's hang out. Let's, let's become more comfortable with one another. Maybe, you, in, the future, maybe in the future we, we won't have this kind of drama again. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Brewer from So John puts his money where his mouth is and invited everyone to his house. <laughs> and I have the email to prove it. Hi, I'm Jim Brewer from Worcester Township. I was here at last meeting. Um, I applaud you for taking a look at the data. I was worried that hubris was going to come in, but clearly that's not the issue now. A um, couple things. Um, when you talked about the committees, I think they're good. Uh, just don't stovepipe them, because I think some of those committees will have impacts on others. So make sure they have touch points as they're going through the process, because they may learn some additional data that is a factor that may make a decision. Uh, the other is, you know, I heard a lot of people talk about it's all about the kids. The, ultimately, it's the kids' education. But your job is not just the kids' education, it's the kids, the best kids' education that we as a community can afford. So it is, you know, I'd love to send my kids to Ivy League schools, I can't afford it. So we have to do with what the best with what we have. You know, I pay $10,000 in school taxes. Is 11 good? I don't know. 10's not good. But in any way, understand that the school board still does have a budget that they're trying to live within. So, thanks.
Uh, John Andrews, Law of Providence. Uh, I'm trying to keep my comments to the motion on the floor. And uh, <clears throat> I've made comments to school boards at Methacton starting in 2005. In 2006, I started projections. And uh, just this week, I issued to the uh, board secretary a report reviewing the, the report by the Pennsylvania Economy League on, an, on your projections. And uh, clearly, I wasn't the only one that found flaws there. Uh, the, uh, what I hear from the community is that they have a lack of trust in, 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 in people on the, uh, on the stage. Uh, I, I, I don't support that from the standpoint that the Pell, Pell presented the facts of declining enrollment for, in, for instance, uh, K to five starting in 2002. Uh, they project the enrollment will continue to go down. And that's what I've been finding in my projection studies uh, starting in 2006. Uh, I'm projecting a, further, a, a stronger decline than PEL. Uh, <clears throat> now, with regard to the motion on the floor, uh, I think with, with due respect to the superintendent that there's a lot of things going on, on in this district in, in 2015. Uh, one of them is the Fields Project. Uh, also, we have a, a, a somewhat unusual administrative setup in Methacton. We do not have an assistant superintendent. Uh, I've made that suggestion to various people and, and uh, uh, for whatever reason, it hasn't gone anywhere. But with regard to these committees, uh, I have had thoughts that the committees should report to the board. The committees that reported to the superintendent on Skyview gave no report, took no votes. They were just a, a tool for the superintendent. Uh, the, the board was out of what, what went on with, those with that committee. So I think that in this present situation, we ought to have an independent facilitator uh, riding herd on the committees, uh, pulling them together, helping them, uh, whatever, and then reporting uh, to the superintendent. But I, I, I just don't see our superintendent being spread, uh, having enough time to handle all of these committees, and I think all of these committees are necessary. Uh, and I also support uh, a somewhat different schedule, perhaps a, a decision in, in next January, or the reports, uh, uh, draft reports being put out in, in October. Thank you. Thank you, John. Anyone else for, board, for public comment on board action item? My name is Valerie uh, Jed Wabney, and I represent Yerkes, AKA Collegeville. Uh, with regards of this enrollment study going around, um, what I'd like to know is if this district is a business and our students are a product and sales are down, what are you doing to boost sales? What I'd like to know is what are you doing to boost enrollment, to draw people to the district and to keep us competitive with the local districts around? Houses may be cheaper in PV or Springford or other districts, but if people want to come here, they will pay more to live here. And I would just like to know, in the grand scheme of things, with all the decisions that you are making about the school and, and the district, if you're keeping in mind that you're trying to keep us competitive with the other districts, that's all I'd like to say. Good evening, my name is Pat Shuey, um, Arrowhead Elementary. My girls have both graduated from Methacton High School, but 
this is part of my community and what's going on here still impacts my community. Uh, the one thing that concerns me about any um, projections are they tend to be linear in na nature and one directional uh, where they're really cyclic. The populations are cycl cyclical. Um, I've lived in this township for 28 years. When we first moved here, after a decline in enrollment, two elementary schools were closed. Worcester and Audubon were not open at that time. Very shortly after we moved here, it became apparent that population was on the increase and suddenly we were out of capacity and no place to put these students. Worcester was condemned. Audubon housed the Lower Providence Library, so one new school had to be built, one had to be retrofitted, and a library had to be built and moved out of the elementary school. Um, I just want you to keep in mind that with a lot of these studies, I know it's difficult to project accurately five years, let alone ten years out, but when you're looking at your capacities, keep in mind that you might need a contingency plan because 15 years out, your enrollments might be going up again and you don't want to be back in that same situation where you no, have no school open to put the students in. And the other thing I wanted to say is your committee, when you're looking at impact on staffing, keep in mind specifically the special area teachers like the arts, your uh, general music teachers, your librarians, and your art teachers who are already traveling their shared resources among your schools, and how potentially closing a school and moving students around will affect them, and also how it will affect your long-term subs. Thank you. Thank you. There's no other public comment on board action item? Okay, sorry. I was hoping somebody would hit my last point. I had a bunch of them, but they've all been covered, so I'll be brief. Uh, I'll start by saying uh, Joe Donahue from Audubon. Um, the, uh, the thank you is warranted uh, from my perspective for your taking cause for pause. Um, I do look forward to the information that comes out on volunteering for the committees. Um, I, I, and I think <laughs> it seems simple, but the, uh, the, the lady that asked about what problem are we solving for, I think is a great question, because until she said it, I, I, I just don't know. So if we truly understood what we're trying to solve for, the recommendations might be a whole lot more meaningful moving forward. Um, <clears throat> now, personally, I would immediately retain the first gentleman who spoke on the 23rd, as well as the first gentleman that spoke tonight, who I believe are the same person. Um, <clears throat> but if the board sees fit, I would highly recommend, if you intend to bring Pell back, if for any reason, to review or stand behind or explain their data that you consider that gentleman or an independent gentleman of the same stature, clearly smarter than I, but with 14 patents, he can't be wrong, um, to, to advise the board and the superintendent. You can't consume data without a data level expertise. You can't ask informed questions if you don't understand what you're seeing. I work in pharmaceuticals and I, I, I know statistical significance and I don't know a, a one hundredth of what that gentleman probably knows. But I do know that when we don't know something, you find an expert to guide your decision making. For legal reasons, Pell is never going to admit that the data they provided is wrong. They're never going to admit that. And lastly, the only other question that I had um, as it related to the committees. Um, look, we know probably better than most that our kids are proving to us that we live in a time of communication overload. There's got to be a way for the board and the superintendent, the school, however you want to, whoever needs to validate it, to find a web-based communication platform for these committees to share out the minutes from their meetings on an ongoing basis through the process. 
I guarantee you there are people in the community that would love nothing more than to volunteer for these committees, but their, their home situations, their work situations won't allow for it. We have to find a way, and, and there is a way. I don't have the answer, but I would be willing to help find it to communicate regularly on what the committees are doing, what they're looking at, why they're looking at it, what findings they're coming up with, and be able to field, proactively field input from the rest of the district to help guide the process moving forward. It sure would be, it would be a, a real shame to put these committees together with the best of intentions, get to the November time frame, present out some information only to find out that, oh, geez, that would have been a really good idea. We should have looked at that. I don't think anybody's omitting data purposefully. Thank you. Thank you. Candy Alaba, Eagleville. On your agenda, you have public comment on board action items. How can we comment on your change orders when we have no idea what the information is? Why is there no attachment? Why wasn't the information given to us before we were asked to comment on it? I can't, we can't comment on anything we don't know about, and there's change orders already put in place, and you haven't even put shovel to dirt yet. So you need to, before you vote on something and want public to speak on it, you need to put the information out there for us to know what you're going to vote on. Kind of like what Lower Providence Township does. They discuss the situation, then ask the public if they have any comments. Then they vote on it. Also on this issue of enrollment, you want to look at another expert to come in and give you most likely the same figures you already have. You've had John Andrews giving you enrollment figures for the last nine years, since 2006. And I've been sitting in those meetings, and his enrollment figures have basically been almost on the money up until the day before the gentleman from Pell gave you his enrollment report. John Andrews submitted the same report, and the Pell verified what John Andrews has been telling you for years. A number of years ago, there was discussion about eventually one school would have to be closed. But unfortunately, no one from the public was there to hear that. Now, you have a capacity report that Pell put together. In November, you had Snyder Electric give you a PowerPoint presentation to get the energy audit for the school district. And they put pictures up that showed the shape that these schools are in. Again, nobody was in the room to see it. So why do you have to keep hiring more people to give you the same information? You have not acted on anything. And as far as the modulars, they have been there since you came on the board. You've done nothing to shut them down. They've been there since before Skyview. No one has moved on the modulars. And now they're a problem? No one has been around for the last nine years. Are all you people going to be here in June when they vote to raise your taxes? Because you weren't there last June. So you can't be upset now when a board is doing something that you don't agree with because you have not held them responsible for anything. They're sitting here telling us they want to hear what we have to say. We've been told in that room more than once we were to be seen and not heard as a member of the public. Now, unfortunately, this is what happens when the public is not engaged on a regular basis. I'm going to throw down a challenge. Start showing up at all the school board meetings. Start speaking out. Hold them accountable for everything they do instead of four people. That's now. Where were you back in November when they talked about it? Well, you know what? You can get angry all you want, but I've been in meetings when there's only four people sitting there. Okay. But you know what? Please let's. I'm not. I paid my fair share. No, you didn't pay for me. Can we please let her finish her public comment? I didn't interrupt anyone when they were speaking. All right. Excuse me. All right. M Mrs. Allbach, let's, can I, can I have order, please? I would let, like to finish let, my comment about uh, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to finish, but let's, let's, let's do two things here. Number one, this is public comment. You have an opportunity to speak. Please address your questions, or excuse me, your comments to the board. Okay, not to members of the audience. All right. Well, my now, God, these comments now, were addressed to the board. Please, please let me finish. Okay. okay. I will also ask the members of the audience not to engage in debate. This is a public comment section, session, not public debate. So let's stop the dialogue between the person at the podium and, and the members of the audience, and we'll get through this quickly. All right? 
Thank you. You can resume your comments. I appreciate that. Okay, Candy, please finish. Well, my question is, are you going to tell the public what the change orders are? I mean, I, I can't say whether I agree or disagree since I don't have the information in front of me. Maybe you need to start when you put your agendas out, put attachments like Worcester does, and to show the public what you're voting on, or at least put it online so we have information so we can comment on what you're doing instead of being blindsided. But my only other comment is, unfortunately, it smells like election season, and I am not really thrilled what I'm seeing. And they outsourced our employees. Maybe you need to outsource your board. Please, please make your comments to the board. Thank you. Is there anyone else with public comment? Go ahead. Hello, Karen Vavra, Eagleville Elementary. So as is the theme tonight, I too am happy and encouraged to hear that this board isn't following your typical pattern of blindly following your consultants and attorneys. As I mentioned at the board meeting when this study was presented, the projects and committees on capacity will involve real expense, specialists, consultants, and undoubtedly being billed by lawyers. It's right to focus our tax dollars on this effort. It's important, and it's what we should focus on. With all that is involved here, how can this board continue to justify funding on an appeal of the field project when we need to spend all available funds on education efforts and particularly this extraordinarily important capacity discussion? Ma'am, this is just public comment on board action item, so yeah. please, yeah, I get it. Which please has, direct it which to... Which has field projects. It, field projects has nothing to do with this. So right, please, you have a field please, project on the field action project item. has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I'm going I'm to continue because okay. the money does. The appeal is competing for the same the money that hires that. these important the, consultants on the critical study needs. Ma'am, the taxpayers the, the are not an endless has source to of do funds. With, if, you have, if you want to comment on the change order, or if you want to comment, well, we don't know what the change the motion, order is about. So or it's you hard can to take focus this up on during that. public comments. Right. So okay. we don't know what the change order is about. So I'm focusing on the fields, which is on the agenda, and this discussion. The appeal is not on the agenda. Let's go back to taxpayer, taxpayer dollars then. Yeah. The taxpayers are not an endless source of funds to pay lawyers and consultants on topics that are not focused on education. Either comment on the appeal, comment on the change order, comment on the motion on the floor, or save your comment until courtesy of the floor. I would ask that this board consider what's important. You have a lot to consider here. It's the same thing I said when the capacity study was presented at the board meeting. Consider what's important and spend our dollars on education efforts, this conversation particularly, and not on other things that are at your discretion and are done behind closed doors. Thank you. Diana Kernop, CoMEA President, and as I was sitting in the audience, I really wasn't going to get up and speak tonight. Um, and as I listened to all the people speaking, I did think that it was appropriate that MEA get up and, um, and share our, our thoughts. It has been, um, as it has been for the parents, the community, the students, it has been a long month for um, all of us, the faculty as well. Uh, the uncertainty and not knowing what's going to happen and the timelines involved. I want to say thank you to all of you for reconsidering the timeline. Uh, on behalf of all the staff, or all the staffs here, and the community, and the children. Um, whatever the outcome is going to be, at least we will all feel that you have investigated it soundly, and that will be appreciated. And please know that you have staff who work here, who care about the kids, who care about the community, who will be more than will willing to serve on your, on your committees. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Liz Kamenetz. I'm just going to be very brief. I just want to make sure that um, on one of these committees, one of the uh, topics of concern, I'm assuming maybe the Finance Committee, is going to be the impact of property values of the possible sale of Audubon Elementary and how that affects the surrounding neighborhood, but also our entire committee, our entire community. Um, I'm very concerned that selling Audubon is going to cause a drop in property values and thus a drop in our tax collections. And this just becomes a death spiral for our financing of our schools. So I just want to make sure that that is going to be a topic of concern for one of the committees. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Elizabeth Drummond from Eagleville. Um, thank you again for the reconsideration of the timeline of this issue. I submitted a graph to the board at the hearing showing a bell curve of enrollment from 2001. Piggybacking on a previous comment, I would like to build on the point of populations being cyclical in nature and point out that at the end of 2001, there were 5,020 students enrolled in Methacton. And at the end of 2014, there were 5,040 students enrolled in Methacton. So there are more students enrolled today than there were at the end of 2001. So if you just go back a little bit further and really look at the data, you get a really different picture of how precipitously your, your enrollment is declining. And I think that, piggybacking on the point of the 1990s, I think it would be really interesting and enlightening maybe to look at that data set, look at how the population ebb and flow has changed in the district and the impact it has had on our building and our enrollment. Thank you. Anyone else? For, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Ashley Power, 145 Level Road. So I am not a scientist or mathematician or anything like that. Um, but I keep hearing all these, you know, ideas and suggestions, and with all the awesome community um, behind us, I was wondering if we could have a committee put in place for possibly allowing us to try and save our school by means of fundraising. Um, I think we should be allowed to see, you know, the list of cost and repairs of what has to be done to these schools, itemized lists that still hasn't been given to us. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I'm one hell of a party planner. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Wright from Lower Providence. Other than uh, you, Jim, and a brief introduction to you, Brenda, uh, this Monday, I don't really know anyone on the board. But I assume that outside of the school board that you've reached a level of success in your careers. And I assume that that level of success, um, and delivering that level of success in your careers is a little bit different than running a school board. But I also assume that there are some standards, some values that persist regardless of the endeavor. Values like transparency, diligence, open-mindedness. This approach isn't showing any of those. We're not defining the problem. We're coming out with recommendations that startle a community and cause the, the, your constituents a lot of lost sleep. I'm certain that this process is not meeting your standards that you bring to your professions or to your homes. And if it's not good enough for there, it's not good enough for your constituents, it's not good enough for the taxpayers, and it sure as hell is not good enough for the children. So my request tonight is that we press reset. If I take this, these presentations at face value, if this is what they are, they clearly won't meet your standards. They don't meet ours as a community. Press reset, come out, tell the story. Define the problem we're trying to solve. Come up with creative ideas from closing a school to closing two schools to disbanding the district to fundraising to a whole slew of other things. Maybe we'll have seven options, but they'll be good options. This process has brought forward the community. They present themselves as intelligent, pragmatic, and full of insights you don't have without them. Step out of the shadows. Be transparent. Tell the story. Together, we'll solve the problem. Thank you. Anyone else for public comment on board action items? Hello, good evening. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for considering and reconsidering all the options we provided during our last meetings. I just want to go over a few things. I'm sorry, ma'am, could you say your name and general I'm sorry. For My name is Savita Collegeville. My kids have, uh, are at Arrowhead and uh, Arcola Elementary. Just want to address a few things. Um, 
I really want to applaud the audience for asking what the problem is. And I really believe that we've already provided all the solutions that are needed to resolve the problem. If the problem is capacity, we have had a solution for that. Many parents and experts have provided reviews and how, you know, we know how the Pell studies never made any sense. And we've already formed committees. You're talking about forming committees. We've already had the opportunity to form committees, as other parents have mentioned. We've been working on it for such a long time now. And we've had most of the experts provide every single detail that could be pulled out from all of these studies, as well as from any other resource they could possibly go into. And I also want to say that instead of going around and wasting time in hiring additional people to do all this work, take into consideration all the data that's already been provided to the board and to all of the public, and reevaluate that as a team, sitting with all of these expert community members who have contributed so much, and then make the decision. Don't, don't even think about December 2015. I think you should make a decision now and say we're not closing any schools. That's really important. And because there's really there's no problem here because solutions have been provided and it's just going round and round there are modulars you okay swap the modulars and just rebuild try to focus on refixing what is the problem if it's buildings refix the buildings you know fix all of the leaks things like that those are not going to cost you much instead of causing all this emotional trauma to all the parents and the children i think it's not really fair and I also want to say, um, I have one um, other point that I want to address because there was a lady here who said why we were never here at any of the other meetings. Um, I want to say this is the question of our children, the future. So we are there. And all the other times, we always assume that the board, you as our elected members, are doing a great job. So we never found it necessary to interfere. But now when it comes to the question of our children, and the future of our community, we really wanted to step up and speak up. And the community is growing. It is not what it was 10 years ago. So we are here to make sure that everything that is done is in the benefit, our ch benefit of our children here. I have one recommendation. Don't close any school. That's it. Close this right now. End the hearing. It's all done. Please, just stop it. Thank you. Thank you. OK, that concludes public comment and board action items. There is a motion on the floor from Mr. Pelicano, uh, second by uh, Vice President Hackett, to direct the superintendent to establish committees, gather additional information. Um, we outline the committees and have the committees present a report no later than November 15th. Um, with no vote taking uh, place on any decision around closing a school prior to December 2015. Is there any discussion from the board? Mr. Phillips. Yes. Uh, um, before setting up those committees, uh, I think the board has to see uh, as they're formed the framework in which they're going to work. Also, uh, check-in dates that the board will know the progress leading up uh, and if there's information available that we could put out to the public and that we do that. Also, uh, the Community Impact Committee, I think uh, a few people made the point, uh, such as if we did close down Audubon by chance, you have neighbors that will be impacted, what their property values will do, what uh, what's impact that local area. And I'll go back to that, we have to have that involvement of the community as a whole and also represent all the demographics, even the ones that don't go here that live around Audubon. So I think that's an important uh, committee to have. Additional discussion? I just have one more thing. When it comes to the capacity study and we have these committees, can we make sure that we have principals from these actual buildings either consulted, review the data, do something to come back to us so we can know that these principals But just so that we can see that, I just want to make sure that they yeah. see the same things that we Definitely. See. Good point. Other discussion? Marie, anything else? 
Yeah, I'm good. See? You all thought she was asleep. Shame on you all. All right, seeing none, I will call the question. All those in favor of the motion, signify by raising your hand. Maria, you can say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. The uh, motion passes. Okay, moving on to items for board action. 6.1, field project change order, Dr. Zerby. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, just to give a little bit of history before I go into some of the specifics uh, re regarding this change order, um, we are recommending a change order to address the ability to provide the conduits around the stadium and uh, auxiliary fields for the light installations once we get through our appeal with the uh, the PA Common, uh, the Court of Common Pleas, with the, the town, with Worcester Township. So, when we originally approved the bids, the electrical contractor had an option of, and, and placed bids in for for the two options. The first option being providing all electrical services, including lights, meaning the poles, the fixtures, and 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 all the copper related to that installation. Or option two, providing all the electricity, uh, excluding exclusive of the conduits, the poles, and the uh, light fixtures. What we're bringing to you this this evening are just the conduit runs to the locations in the plans that that will allow us to do the installations of the lighting once we are through the appeal process. So with that said, I will read uh, what the recommendation is from the, uh, the contract uh, uh, recommendation. To install five empty one and a quarter inch EMT conduits needed for the stadium field lighting. To install six empty one and a quarter inch EMT uh, conduits needed for the auxiliary field lighting. To install five empty one and a quarter inch PVC conduits and all uh, uh, boxes outside the stadium field lighting and to install six empty quarter inch uh, PVC conduits to all boxes for the auxiliary field lighting. All these conduits are to be run to the uh, locations where the lighting is, is currently located on the plan. The, the price for the change order is one, $139,500 and let me explain what that price reflects. That replace, price reflects a let me grab my sheet here. It reflects our, our, our overall cost uh, moving forward at this point of $5,057,700. Uh, um, if you approve the change order this evening. That change order was, as part of the property committee uh, this past week, uh, reviewed. It was recommended that we do several things as part of that process. One, that we check with Musco, the lighting uh, provider, that the conduits and all the uh, materials that were to be run are in compliance with and conform to their specifications. We've done that and uh, we, are, we have gotten confirmation that it so does meet those specifications. Secondly, we have uh, put the same specifications out through a third party to review the cost and to assess those costs. That provider came back at approximately $22,000 greater than the cost that the current contractor is proposing. And in fact, the contractor is, is what's in front of you, the contractor is accepting $5,000 less than what their original proposal was on the matter. This allows us as part of, if with your approval this evening, allows us to have the current electrical contractor through this change order not only do the, the electrical con, uh, construction work that they were originally approved for, but allows them to simultaneously put in the additional conduits that will eventually be needed for the uh, field lighting at both the stadium and auxiliary field. This will prevent us from having to tear up the field uh, and, and the surrounding area later to install this equipment. 
it is my recommendation this evening that the board consider approving this change order uh, as, uh, as provided. Questions for Dr. Serby? Just one more point to add. Uh, the reason why this wasn't in the original bid package was we were not done the conditional use process through Worcester. So this would have been all wrapped up in the original uh, bid package, but being that we didn't have a, any type of ruling at the time, we had to break this out separately. Uh, but we subtracted an amount for the lights from the original electrical bid that was submitted. I think it was something like $842,000. Did that not include all of the work with the lights, including the conduit? Dave, you have those numbers at hand, or well, yes. When we when we approved option B, which would be the work uh, for all the electrical work except for that running to for for field lighting, which would include the conduits, which would include the uh, the base uh, bases in the ground as well as the poles and the fixtures. Uh, those costs were. Uh, excluded out of option B and any of the materials were excluded out of option B which is the one we accepted as part of and is the only one we is the only one we could accept because of our uh, appeal uh, with the decision of, of Worcester Township so this amount will be part of that 842,000 that we left out uh, because we didn't do that piece of it Right, exactly. And so the price of 842 won't be increased by any amount if we do this. That's correct. It'll be decreased by 5,000. Is that what you're saying? They got the, the well, what we what we the original uh, quote from uh, the the Janie company, the current contractor, was 5,000 greater than what we're we have here today. In addition. A third party uh, spec'd out and priced this out and was $22,000 greater than what Janie has provided. So we feel as part of our committee that has looked at all of not only the, uh, the specifications and have put the last uh, RFP forward and have, has done the legwork uh, to get us to the point where we are today, uh, their review uh, is consistent with this being a, a, a fair price for us to get the work completed and on time uh, for the, uh, the the lights and the field project. Additional questions for Dr. Zerby? Yeah, I just want to make sure I understand this. So this, this amount of money is part of the overall lighting aspect of the fields which were not awarded due to the conditional use issue. And now that we are clearing that up, we are going to begin spending money on lighting. Is that essentially correct? That is correct. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so, based on on the direction that Superintendent got before he to bring all change orders above ten thousand dollars in front of us. So, is there a motion to um, approve the superintendent with moving forward with this field project change order? Mr. Pelicano, is there a second? Mr. Phillips, discussion. Marie, any questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, seeing none, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor? We, we offered public comment on this before. They didn't know what it was. Okay. All right, John. Okay, come on up. Uh, John Andrews, Law of Providence. Uh, so, at one point you had received an electrical bid for 842000 and if I heard correctly, because you're breaking that contract up into pieces, this evening you want to, uh, an okay for the change order of about 140000 and the net cost raises the 842000 up to 864,000, if I understand what was said. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the, 
but to me, there's also an implication that what goes on at the Court of Common Pleas will not be resolved very quickly. Uh, you know, if it was going to be resolved in May, you'd have plenty of time to put in the conduit in June or July and meet the August schedule. So, in a way, it, it's it's bad news that that the uh, court case is. Uh, you know, I infer from what's being said that the court case will be protracted for whatever reason. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? I suppose the byproduct of creating controversy and attracting hundreds of people to your meetings is you actually get questions about issues you didn't anticipate. So I, I was just hoping for clarification as I was listening to you all. Uh, are you considering a motion to commit $130,000 for work to install lighting for which you don't currently have approval and may never have approval? Can you explain this a little bit? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, here's, what the, here's what the board is approving at this point in time. We received our approval for a land development plan. And because of the status of the litigation, we separated the two issues. We separated the entire development process that exists with regard to the fields and the like, and the individual lighting issue itself, which was the installation of the poles and the lights. This portion of the bid was included with the installation of the lights and the poles. What this is, is the conduit that runs around the field, which is uh, you use then to connect it to your electrical system so that you can light the lights on the field. Okay. Because of the fact that we are doing all of the grading and all of the field work at this time, the correct way of handling this is to put that conduit in at the time that the, that the field work is being done. It will then have the opportunity of being attached to whatever light standards are placed on the field at whatever locations and whatever lighting system is eventually located on the poles. So this is so that we don't do all of the field work with regard to the entire site and then come back and rip it up later at a time when the poles and the lighting is installed. So because this was all one portion of the bid, the conduit, the lights, and the poles were all one portion of the bid. This portion of that portion of the bid is being broken from that and attached to the issue of the land development. That, that's helpful. Thank you for the clarification. So if I could just ask a follow-up question. Do the conduits serve any purpose if you can't attach the light poles to them? If, if you can't, I'm sorry, what? Attach the light poles to them. Well, in other words, in other words it, let me, let me clarify. It, so if you don't have approval for the light poles, to the conduits that you're, uh, you're, you're moving to spend $130,000 on now ever serve any purpose for the district? We, we have approvals for lighting. We do not have approvals to play at the safe levels of illumination for certain of the sports. The, and and let, me, let me explain to you what's happened here. The issue of litigation was, was discussed earlier this evening. It's the township that put us in the litigation process. The township could have, by right, given us the right to illuminate the field to the level suggested by the school board's experts. They could have done that by right. They could have included that in their ordinance. They decided, in their opinion, not to do that and instead put us into the conditional use process. They could have also given us the height of the poles that we needed. They could have done that by right also under the ordinance. They chose not to do that. When they established the conditional use process, they made us file an application with the township 
and allowed parties to get into that matter and create a matter of litigation before their township board of supervisors. That was their choice. We can't draft their ordinances, only they can. We suggested that they do it another way and give us that by right, and instead they did not, and they chose not to, which is their right as a board of township supervisors to put us in that litigation mode, if you will. We tried that case over a period of the uh, last couple of years, and we, we finished and we concluded and we received a decision. Interestingly, and it's our interpretation of the ordinance, that the issue of illumination levels on the field is for us to suggest under the ordinance. And in our interpretation, nowhere does it say that the board is to make the determination as to what levels of illumination we can play at. I'm sorry, is that the township board that you're talking the about? The township ordinance that we're referring to. Our, our position is that under the ordinance, if you read the ordinance, what it says is that we have to suggest the minimum safe illumination levels at which to play. Now, just think about it in, in, in this framework. We suggested that the minimum safe levels of illumination uh, at which to play were 50 foot candles for the issue of the football games and 50 foot candles for the issue of lacrosse games and lacrosse practice. That was verified by the uh, lighting consultants expert, the, the, the uh, gentleman uh, who testified, a gentleman by the name of Bob Zoller, who works for Musco. And it was also verified by the Penn State expert that we brought in uh, to testify on our behalf before the board. And both of them testified that those illumination levels were the minimum illumination levels necessary for safe play. That's the standard in the ordinance. The problem that we have with the decision is as was stated by Mr. Bustard when he, when he gave his opinion that night and rendered the opinion, is that they compromised the matter. And they determined that we could only play at 30 foot candles of illumination. Well, obviously, this board cannot make a decision to play at less than what our experts have testified is the safe level of illumination on the field. That's the problem and why we primarily need the matter of litigation is because the board cannot decide, and it's my advice to them, that they cannot decide that you put your experts up and suggest that the minimum level of safe lighting is 50 foot candles and then play at something less. We would not do that and jeopardize the safety of the students. Obviously, from a litigation standpoint, anybody that got hurt out there would immediately use our evidence against us in the conditional use hearing to sue the school district. And, and it's not just a matter of suing the school district. It's primarily a matter of the safety of the kids that are involved in the, in, in the programs. So that is, in large measure, what has caused the matter of litigation. The second thing is there's, a, there's another issue. The other issue was the, uh, the height. Now, we have not appealed that because we really, really can't do that. Uh, but the, uh, the testimony by all experts in that was that if the, if the township were to allow us to go to a 100-foot level of lighting, that we, would be, um, that we would actually be more focusing the light on the playing field. There would be less light spillage at the property line and the uh, uh, and the, uh, we know as a matter of fact that the cost of that lighting system would then be less. But the township decided not to give us uh, that opportunity. Now that's not something that's part of the litigation, but that's something that you should also know with respect to the matter of litigation. So the board's doing what it can do uh, with, uh, with regard to the, uh, to the litigation. We really don't have an alternative at this sure. point if you want to play. So uh, thank you again. That's actually sure. very helpful background. So as I understand it then, if the board is moving ahead with development of the land and installation of the conduits, the board's underlying assumption must be that if the board is restricted to 30 foot candles, it will go ahead and use the lights at 30 foot candles because otherwise there would be no purpose in spending the money on the land development and the conduits. Is that accurate? It would, it would, be, able to, it would be able to use the light at the 30 foot candle level for the, for the other sports that they would use the lights for. Yes, I mean, we, we, we certainly uh, 
are going to do everything that we can to win the matter of litigation. I think that our interpretation is correct with respect to the law and with respect to the, uh, the ordinance in question. Uh, it would be my advice to the board that they not play football games at the location uh, if we were not able to get 50 foot candles of illumination in light of the fact that the Penn State expert that we brought in said that that's the minimum safe level of lighting that's necessary. Right. So we would be using the conduit and the lighting system for the other sports. Thanks for your indulgence. I appreciate the explanation. Thank you, sir. Joe Orson, Collegeville. He just actually asked uh, my question about it. Just to follow up, what are those other sports that are going to draw crowds at night on on apparent weekends? Or like, what what? How much use are these lights going to get if not for football? I have. You know, I'm. I, no, that, I, I, I guess I don't want to turn this meeting into a, into a discussion of the of the uh, uh, of the. Of the case but it's fair I mean it's a fair question you've uh, you've asked that I opened the the, uh, the discovery I guess of, of this issue um, let me let me talk about that specifically there are no other sports that bring the level of, uh, of participation by by spectators that football does obviously uh, the some of the other sports and I don't remember all of them but soccer field hockey things of that nature that uh, uh, the band uh, activities etc there was there was testing Testimony that that here is essentially why the district needed it, and it, this was this was done at some length by Dave Horn, who was our architect, uh, who uh, who testified, and also uh, some of the other uh, witnesses that we had. Essentially, the way it works is if you have a field that is a grass field, it, and it is not, uh, it does not have lights on it. It counts as one field night. If you have a field that is a grass field and it has it is it has uh, lighting on it, uh, that counts as two fields because you're able to use it at different times. If you have a field that has lights on it and has the synthetic turf surface, it counts as three fields because you can use it at different times. You can use it in inclement weather and you can use it at different times of the day or night because of the lighting. So if you then take a look at your overall campus and you make a determination as to what student activities you can fit on that, to the extent that you have lights and synthetic, synthetic turf, you are adding two additional field nights for each grass unlit field, okay? That gives you a lot more flexibility with your schedule. It gives you a lot more flexibility with your programming. It certainly allows you to do a lot more with less fields, thereby alleviating, alleviating the necessity of going out and purchasing additional land for additional fields. And all of that is part of the equation. I don't have the exact charts, but they're all in the record. And if, you, if you'd like to see it and go further, uh, you can talk to Dr. Zerbe and we'll make it available to you. Okay. And just one last little thing to clarify, because I'm not sure I completely understand. You're changing the time kind of of when you're spending this money to to so that it can be done with changing the grounds what is the change in the cost associated is there a change in the cost also along with that uh, actually I'll let dr. Zerby speak to that can you clarify that question again? It sounded like house. you're moving up the timeline on this piece so that it can be done before the grading and, and such with the fields, which does make sense to me. But I just wanted to clarify, is that the only thing that this change order is related to, or is there a change in the cost for this as well? $5,000 less. Uh, it, well, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the, time, the timeline, it, and this is, the, the, the change order is specifically related to the fact that the yes. options for the initial bids did not did, had you had all the lighting, all the electricity in at one, yes. or you had this other you know yes. lesser component. There's this one portion of the other portion that we need to get in place so that we're not so so that's the particular matter, and it allows us to do it now, yes. which we would have done in the first place yes. if the bids weren't yes. that. Got that part constructed that way. Thank you. So this is a this is a proper step for us to, to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's at a at a price that is consistent with our evaluation of, of other uh, companies that, that that assessed it, and we think that this is uh, uh, an appropriate thing for us to do at this stage of the game. Okay, so the cost is the same regardless of the change in the. 
right? Well, it's it's it, again, it, it's the the cost is is the cost where it is where it is now. Okay. I mean, I, so I, nothing I is changing the price, just the way it's being. Uh, documented and handled with with the structure. That's correct. Of the, the price is one hundred and thirty nine thousand okay. five hundred dollars. Thank you. And that was as it always was. Well, actually, it was allocated differently because, as I stated earlier, the so conduit was in the bid with the lights and the poles, and now it's being removed from that and placed on its own so that it can be installed at the time of the field changes as opposed to the lights and the pole installation. Okay, so you didn't have a price for this specific piece. It was rolled up into a bigger piece. You had an overall cost. Thank you. Additional, okay. Uh, Jim Brewer, Worcester Township. So you mentioned like 800 and some thousand. So that 120, 130 would come off of that 800,000. In other words, to finish it, you're not increasing above that 800,000 and something to finish it. You had that 138, you're just reshifting, you're taking part of that out, and you've got a firm commitment from the contractor to finish it for the balance without, without a cost increase. When you say the balance, which would include the the uh, the, poles, the pegs, the, the poles, the lights, yeah. um, we we that that determination will happen in the future when we when we find out what happens with the 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 matter of litigation before us. The matter of litigation before us could um, require us to make different decisions depending on the outcome. So if, if we are not successful at winning of the litigation, we may need to make different decisions. And, 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 and with that said, our costs may shift or change as, as a matter of that. But we still will have the ability to put lights in. It's just at what level, at what, meaning the number of fixtures, the height of the poles, uh, et cetera. So if you get what you originally put in for, I assume you had a firm fixed price for that contract. You're now saying of that firm fixed price, there was 800 and some thousand dollars left on that second part of a change order because you held off because of the litigation. You did what you could. Now you're saying, hey, it makes more sense before we grade it. Let's do it now. Let's get it in place. Let's do the rough end, so to speak. But if you win and you get what you want, there will not be a price increase from that balance of 800 and some thousand minus 130. You've got a firm commitment from the contractor on that. That 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 is not accurate. Okay. So what 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 does that mean? That you're going to then rebid or recompete or rebid the we, we, balance at, of the work? Yeah. At the at the time when we determine what options we have available to us, the outcome of the litigation, we have several options. We can we can go back to the current uh, uh, vendor and get a get a, a price from them we can bid that out we can actually uh, purchase the materials off of state contracts um, and and receive uh, different pricing than we might be able to get out, out in the, into the general market so we need we need to assess that as we move forward with this process and it really will depend on the outcome of the litigation so the so, so I'm not I, I don't want to mislead okay. you and tell you that we have that that commitment generally speaking we are targeting that particular amount of money as as the right. total outcome of outlay of, of, of expenses for completing the project but it may change depending on, depending on the outcome right. of so the litigation. Your, your proposal, I guess the period that the price was valid for has expired because of the litigation. That, well, so that's, that's why it's open that, that for is rebid. Okay. That is correct. Okay, thank you. And, and also because of the, the state bidding, they, they bid from time to time and the price may go up. Sure, sure. But but in theory, the, the statement that you advanced is generally what we're looking to do. Right. Yes. It's just the quote expired, so now you have to rebid it. And, right. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm John Ferrara from Eagleville. Uh, in my earlier comments, uh, I, I said that I might come to more board meetings in the future. Having seen the normal business of school board meetings, I've decided to not do that. Um, you can figure out the conduits and the foot candles. I'm going to hang out with my kids. <laughs> Thank you. Any <laughs> Yeah, let's get the motion. Yeah, okay. All right, seeing no other public comments, there's a motion and a second. Um, <laughs> is there any, for, any discussion? 
seeing no further discussion, uh, all those in favor? I'm sorry, Maria, any, any discussion? All right, we lost her. Maria, you there? Okay. What? Have you been following along? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, all those in favor? Maria, yeah, I'm assuming that's a yes. Opposed? All right. It, it, it's got enough votes anyway. I will. Okay. Motion passes. All right. Uh, Dr. Zerb, anything else? No, nothing else. Okay. Uh, courtesy of the floor. Any members of the public wish to make comment during courtesy of the floor, please come forward. I'm going to ask that you line up there so we can see who all is uh, is coming. Uh, again, state name and general um, location, and please keep your comments for three minutes. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm back. Uh, Joe Orson, Collegeville. Um, so. I think um, the theme tonight uh, is transparency, whereas before it was why the rush. I'm still kind of on the why the rush bandwagon, but I think transparency is, is now where it's at. And I think the more effort you put into being transparent, the more you're going to win the hearts and minds of your constituency. Um, I think, first of all, as somebody suggested, um, the committees need to bring information back to the public all throughout the process. We can't just be in a black hole until November when we get a recommendation. We would like to offer suggestions and recommendations for further exploration that the things committees might look at or maybe they're not sure of how to get some information or provide some additional information. There's lots of input, lots of smart people in, in the parent community and, and we want to be part of the process. Um, and the other thing that I would like to know is that you're willing to adjust the timeline. I uh, work in, I'm, I have a master's degree in statistics and I've been working in research for over 15 years and conducting research when you have a database to pull your database from takes months. The data that we're trying to gather is legwork. It's all in researching out in the field. And I think it's a very short timeline to expect that all of that data can be gathered, compiled, and presented in a complete and understandable way within the time period um, that, that you're suggesting, especially when, to my understanding, a lot of the committee members will be volunteers. This is not going to be their full-time job. And, and while that's the case, I'm sure they're going to be, you know, putting their best effort into it. But I, I would like to know that, that you're willing to adjust that timeline. I don't think we still need to be in this um, mode of making decisions without having the best information available to us. Um, and finally, I would just... I in, totally enjoyed the discussion we just had on the football field. I, it was, you know, it's kind of random and boring, but it was nice just to have it. And I feel like that's the most we've heard from the solicitor or any board member on any topic since we started the process with, the cl with these hearings on the closing of the schools. Now, granted, he went on at length about the lawsuit, which is lining his pocket and justifying that, but at the same time, it was extremely good just to have that back and forth and the give and take and the willingness to answer questions in public. And I would encourage you to continue to do that with this issue. And I would love to see you have the same passion for the quality of education in our district as you do for our football field. Please make this a priority. Our children should come first before financial issues. Thank you. Thank you. John? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Nascimento. Uh, John Andrews, Lower Providence. Uh, <clears throat> On the second night of the hearing, I, I spoke to some issues and I presented one option, number eight, to keep the five elementary schools intact. I believe they have enough room for K to five, and five would come out of Skyview and six would go to Arcola. 
And I'm well aware that the, while more than half a dozen people spoke at other times during the hearings to the possibility of why do we have Skyview, uh, Mr. Thompson uh, alluded to uh, Skyview and his first three options. Uh, I think that the uh, one of the committees needs to look at at all feasible options and the feasibility issue relative to repurposing of Skyview is 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 absolutely a good one and where the other options were that were initially presented were all financial there's also a financial aspect to Skyview the the approximate cost of the add-on to our cola was about 40 million dollars a portion of our cola was incorporated into Skyview, uh, eight classrooms, corridors, stairways, things like that. So the value of the building without the land is like 45 million. I maintain that capacity-wise, Skyview is not needed. Skyview is the biggest chunk of the excess capacity and there are commercial realtors that, given a chance, would investigate how the building could be repurposed, and clearly repurposing it would return money to, for bond payments. Uh, so, you know, and also, for whatever reason, I didn't hear during the hearings that Skyview is the greatest. We have to have it. Our mission is education. K to five schools in the community are not only education but their community bulwarks. And I see, again I'll repeat that closing Audubon is a short term solution. So uh, you know, I think the, the, the board uh, I think ought to uh, in some way consider at least getting proposals on on Skyview, on on Arrowhead, uh, on uh, Audubon as to their value on in the market. Thank you. Thank you, John. Hi, Ashley Wilkerson from Audubon. Uh, I'd actually like to totally change gears for a minute. There was a policy committee meeting this morning that I wasn't able to, un to attend, unfortunately, but I understand that one of the policies on the agenda uh, was the volunteer policy where you were going to examine whether or not to stop providing liability insurance for people who volunteer at the schools. And I was wondering if first somebody could tell me if that policy was recommended. Could you repeat that? I'm yes, sorry. they're on the website for the policy committee meeting this morning. One of the policies that it said was up for discussion was a change in the current volunteer policy, and it looked like it was redlined through the area that said that the district will provide insurance for volunteers the same as they do for staff members in the district. Was that discussed? That, that was discussed, yes. And do we have a recommendation on whether or not the district will stop providing insurance for volunteers? What we, what we discussed is that we would stop providing in, insurance to the volunteers the same as employees. What we will, what we will do, and, and as we have done currently with the Home and School Association, um, is continue to support them as they become uh, independent. And we also will it's our it's our hope to be able to pull the volunteers underneath that particular umbrella of services with the home and schools once they have their uh, insurance uh, process established. So will the home and school associations then be required to pay for the insurance for their volunteers through the district policy? Not necessarily through the district policy. Right now we have the home and school covered under, as a rider under the district policy. At some point when we, uh, when the, the coordinating council becomes uh, solvent and, and, and independent of the district, um, there is an expectation that they will be able to provide 
uh, the insurance uh, for their members. So just to clarify, in the future it will be sort of a pay to play if we volunteer in the district because when we fundraise for things like book distributions and funding for our science fairs and funding for other activities for our children, we'll also be fundraising to pay for the liability insurance that will be required for us to serve as volunteers in the district because that will come out of our home and school budgets. Yes. So, so hold on. That hasn't that hasn't been adopted. That's been discussed. The policy. So right. But I want to take this opportunity to bring that to everyone's attention because we're talking about spending a lot of money on attorneys to get lights put in the fields. And I would like to think that as a volunteer, my service and I put in several hours a week is at least as valuable to this district as those field lights are. Thank you. Wow. Alan Latanzi, Collegeville. If you don't close a school in the fall, or propose to close a school in the fall, where are the budget cuts going to be? So we've said we're not going to close a school in the fall. I understand that. Um, and the Finance Committee is continuing work with the administration to figure ways to close the deficit that we have for next year's budget. So you don't have an answer? We don't have an answer right now, but we continue to work on the budget and we will have plans that are presented to the board between now and June when the budget's adopted. Okay, and also I understand you passed a motion for the field lights, but I really don't understand why you would put the conduit in the ground when you don't have approval for the lights. And don't give me the 30 or 50 because you all know you want the lights for the, for the football field and for the football use. So the lights aren't going to be used appropriately. So why are you spending 180 or 149,500 hours? We have, we have approval conduit. for lights, and, and as the solicitor said, there's certain sports that we can do. We're hopeful that we get approval for the, the height that we want and that we're, we're fighting for, but we have approval for lights regardless, and so that's why we're doing the conduit work. As a general contractor, I would never shingle a house before I would put the foundation in, just so you know. Additional courtesy of the floor? Hi, Jen Stevenson again. Um, I wanted to just um, make one point about the committees, the proposed committees. Um, I really want uh, you to just consider um, who's staffed on them. Somebody mentioned, you know, getting the principals involved. And while I agree that in theory that would be a good thing, I don't want to see anyone, including any of the doctors over your staff, having to do two jobs at once. One of my concerns um, was that during the month of February, I think some school principals, especially for potential impacted schools, were quote unquote off the job, maybe helping with potential slide decks that were going to be presented in February. So I want to make sure the school principals and anybody in the direct care of children only have to worry about that particular job not also trying to do double duty, so to speak. Not that their involvement isn't important, but again, maybe they can do it in the summer. Their primary responsibility is the um, leadership and the control of the schools and the safety and security of our children. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since I made that request, I absolutely by no means meant to take anybody away from their job. This was just Candy all about after Eagleville. these committees were done, Can't someone us. could look yeah. at it. So right. this was we got not it. to take away. I mean, and the principals have been involved. Right. We didn't want to make a... a they've already, a, been, they've involved, they've already right. been involved, yes. Candy? Okay. Um, well, my first comment is I'd like to make a re recommendation for your finance committee. I recommend Joe Bickelman to be on your finance committee. I think that'd be very smart of you if you would put him on there. Uh, second thing, you're talking about volunteers. I need you to clear something up. I was a room parent for many years in Eagleville. I didn't go through the home at school. I worked in my classroom. Now you're talking about volunteers. I don't know if that is people that volunteer at a home and school or go independently as a room mom to help out in the classroom. Um, this not covering them under insurance sounds really bad. I mean, if they're going to be on school property, shouldn't the school district be covering for any liability? I mean, is that how bad our premiums have gone up since I've asked about insurance coverage since June? I mean, um, this, this is a 
problem waiting to happen. I mean, we, we deal with too many lawsuits in this school district. And I see this as an accident waiting to happen and a major lawsuit. And I don't understand how you're working this. And who exactly does it cover? Does it, would it cover, like say, if I went in as a room mom in kindergarten? Or do I have to go through, I mean, I don't know what's going on with the home and school since it's been restructured. So this just doesn't, I get a bad feeling about this. So I, I don't know how you're going to cover this, but I think there's something you better really look at. And if you're trying to say a couple coins, I don't think that's a good idea. But you might need to make that more clear because you might not get volunteers then. You might have a problem getting po people to come out if they feel like if they get hurt, they're not going to be covered. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Hi, my name is Juan Eagleville. Uh, I'm new. I just moved to the district, and I just want to make two points and ask one question. Um, number one is I, I realize your time is valuable as everyone else that's in the audience here, so thank you for your volunteering. Um, we moved to this particular area because of the school district. So if you think people don't look at that, they do. We looked at over 100 houses for almost a year because we wanted our son to be in this school district because we felt it was the best school district. I come from Upper Marion. It's not a bad school district, but this one was better. So I want you to consider that there are people looking at communities because of the schooling that's offered, number one. Number two, you mentioned about setting the committees and helping out. I, I haven't heard a starting date. I'm a project manager in IT at a large organization, over 200,000 employees. And one thing is for sure, what's the start date? What's the finish date? If you want to start a committee, you're making the recommendations, give us two weeks from now, three weeks from now. When does that start? How do you sign up? And what do you have to do? And to one, one of the gentlemen mentioned, what are the specifics that each of those committees are going to tackle? That's very important if you're going to be successful. I think that it's aggressive. Someone mentioned it. There's too much information that you're trying to gather in a very short period of time. And then to make a quick decision based on that. I don't believe it's going to be successful. I think everyone will put their best effort, but I sincerely, as a 30-year professional doing this, it's not going to happen. Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? One more time. Chris Portman again. Um, it, whether the projections show going down flat or going up when the committees come back and we get good sound results. Is there any effort put into growing our enrollment? So setting goals and saying the next five years we want to have a 5%, 10% growth and figuring out a plan to bring families into the community? Have you folks talked about that at all or thought about that at all? Because it seems more reactive that some trends happening, whether it's natural growth or natural decline, and we react to it by opening Skyview or you know talk about closing schools. But is there any effort to say, you know, we really want to grow our community, really want to grow our school system, and we set long-term goals and we have plans in place to try to achieve those? Is that something the board's worked on at all? So we've certainly discussed opportunities like when reports come out around charter schools not being where they could be, um, strategies around recruiting children from there. It, really, at the end of the day, we're a bit at the mercy of the townships that we serve and okay. the development that happens there and, and the sales that happen in and out there. But we certainly have looked at other opportunities like, you know, can we recruit children back from charter schools? Okay. Good. Um, and on a silly note, you can solve your light problem by installing the whole system now and just putting a dimmer switch on it and figuring out in the end which level you got to put the lights at. Perhaps the clapper. <laughs> Anyone else for courtesy of the floor? Okay. 
um, this gentleman just mentioned about what he doing at track, and I don't agree with it, but I know putting lights on a field, we'll say, hey, they've got a really good football program at Methacton, we should move there. So, and, I mean, I, I am not football, trust me. I'd rather be putting it in more in education, I don't understand the concept. However, that's not how most people think. So they think of football, Friday night lights, we gotta have it. So in some ways, they are responding that will attract people to the school districts, as sad to say as it is. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional public comment? Okay, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Mr. Pelicano, second. Mrs. Barone, all those in favor? Aye. You can vote. <laughs> Wait, Maria? Yes. All right. We stand adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>